Welcome to St. Columba Church. Welcome to St. Columba Church. We are people discovering and sharing infinitely fuller life in Jesus. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, you are welcome. As we gather today to discover and share more of life in Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Columba Church, where, as ever, we're gathering to celebrate the infinitely fuller life that we find in Jesus. Now, this Sunday, 20th February, we are gathering in Drummond School. Uh, we're, we're still going with that. But today, it's long February weekend. Quite a number of uh, our people are away uh, on weekend breaks and we're not able to stream the service, uh, the gathering uh, today and so pretty simple offering for you today on YouTube uh, you're going to hear me reading the, our, our Bible passage today from First Peter chapter 3 in a moment I'll just read that passage and then uh, you'll hear the, the word preached uh, and in the midst of that there'll be some questions where we can pause reflect and I'd invite you to use those times to pray so as you pause uh, in those moments that you would bring your prayers to God about the things that his word is bringing to your heart and mind today. First Peter chapter three, verses 18 to 22. For Christ died for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolises baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. This is my watch. I've had this watch nearly 20 years and so over that time it stopped a few times and every time that it would stop uh, it's the sort of watch I need to take it to a watch repair place to get the battery changed and so you'd be paying a price every time that you did that until one day I bought a, a lifetime battery replacement ticket. So now every time this watch stops um, the price has been paid once and for all time. I can come as many times as I like to get this watch battery changed, get it functioning again as it should be. Price has been paid once and for all. A less trivial example. In communities across the world today, uh, and for a long time, there are people who have to walk miles, many long miles, to get access to clean water. And every time that they need their thirst quenched, which is every day, of course, they have to undertake that long, that gruelling journey. But in many such communities, somebody or a group of people have paid the price to install a well in that place so that there is access to abundant, ongoing provision to meet people's needs day by day. The price has been paid once and for all. To know Jesus is to know the God who has paid a price once and for all. And he's done that for you. His doing that is what brings you the infinitely fuller life. It's what changes your destiny beyond death 
and into eternity. That is the unique achievement and gift and wonder of Jesus, which Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. But before we get into what makes Jesus one of a kind, Peter wants us to know how we are to be like Jesus. Verse 18 starts with the word for. So this is following on from everything we heard last week. Sheena preached for us uh, about Peter telling us suffering for doing good is part of what you should expect in life. And it's investing in loving each other as a church family that's going to see us through that suffering. Peter is going back to where he was in chapter 2, verse 21. As, as he discusses suffering, he talked there about Jesus being an example given us to follow. So Jesus is the best example that we can follow in accepting that suffering happens and living through it. And here in chapter 3, verses 18 to 22, we're reminded that life for Jesus is not the life that we often assume for ourselves. You know, here's how the, the life story goes is that, yeah, there's ups and downs, but, you know, the general trend is is kind of ongoing upwards, things continually improving through our lives. That was not Jesus' life. It was a life that headed downwards to the cross. His destiny and his joy was only to be found on the other side of that. It's suffering before glory. That was Jesus' life. The life given us as an example that we are to follow. And that is how Peter teaches these Christians he's writing to on the margins of polite society to expect life to be. It's suffering before glory. And the big point of Peter's letter is to say, live such lives, live such good lives, especially through your sufferings, that you point other people to Jesus. So Peter says, Follow Jesus' example and don't give up on life. Don't give up on faith when you're living downwards through the suffering that we're being taught to expect. Don't see suffering as a wrong turn, but a road that we're called to walk for the joy set before us that comes on the other side. Perhaps in this life, certainly in the next. I'm going to be thinking um, as we hear God's word today, just a few questions to get you applying it in your own life. We'll pause just now for the first of those. What's more important in this passage, though, is not the ways that we're like Jesus, but the ways that we're not. The ways that Jesus is completely unique. The reasons that you and I and everybody in this world needs Jesus. And the surprising, saving, eternal love that he lavishes on you as only he can. Verse 18 contains loads of life-changing gospel truth. You know, here we find that every one of us needs Jesus, but every one of us is welcome to him. For Christ died for sins, verse 18. For sins. That was the purpose. So it's not that Jesus died to um, give us a, a good example, an inspiring life to, to follow, an inspiring sacrifice to emulate. It's not that Jesus died because he was caught by jealous authorities that wanted to get rid of him. That's not why 
Jesus died, it was for a purpose. Jesus, unique as the only ever perfect human being and as the perfect son of God, gave himself as a sacrifice for sins. The sins of every imperfect, sinful, messed up human being that would accept that gift. It says in verse 18, the righteous for the unrighteous, on, on behalf of the unrighteous. Jesus, the perfect one, on behalf of all of us imperfect people. Jesus' perfection as a sacrifice means that there is no other sacrifice that is needed. Not an animal on an altar, not a vow for you to keep, not a burden for you to carry for the rest of your life, not an action or a habit to make up for what you've done, not your guilt persisting until you expire. Jesus gave this perfect sacrifice of his own life on the cross and paid the sin debt in full, precisely to set you free from all of those things and more. When Jesus went to the cross, there was a, a great exchange that happened there. So he lived this, this perfect human life. Consider how precious that is when there's only one other thing in the world. Jesus lived the perfect human life. And he offered that not on his own behalf, but on our behalf. On behalf of the very imperfect human beings like you and me who've turned our backs on God. So Jesus also took something upon himself that belonged to us. He took all of the sin, all of the shame that separated us from God. And, and so these are the things Jesus did on the cross. What he achieves in that is a reunifying of us and God. The righteous for, on behalf of, the unrighteous. So Jesus gave his perfection to God for us and Jesus took our sin onto a cross for us. All of that for us. Now folks this might be the millionth time that you've heard this you might have uh, gone and put the kettle on but yeah I know this or maybe this is the first time that you've really heard and understood that message. Either way Please don't let the marvel of this be lost on you. God in Christ went to a cross to set you completely free from sin, from death, from guilt, from shame. And when Jesus did this, verse 18 says, he did it once and for all. He did it once and for all. The watch repair thing I was talking about really doesn't matter that much. But you know what? It, it brings me peace of mind. The well provision in a weary community matters a great deal more. And it brings freedom and provision and well-being along with peace of mind to know where the water's coming from. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross brings peace with God. It brings life beyond death. It brings the end of divisions between different human beings. It brings a new church family. It brings a peace of heart and of soul and of mind that can never be stolen by anyone or anything. Jesus' death was once. His sacrifice was perfect. It was total and it was complete. So you are set free from there being anything that you now have to do to be welcome with God, to know him, to belong to him, be part of his family, be his friend, to start that friendship with him today. A friendship that will go on forever. 
that is available to you. Jesus did it all. So there is, there's nothing for you to do but to accept that gift. And Jesus' death was for all. It wasn't only for people who grew up in church. It wasn't for people just who, who've been here for weeks and months and years that you think understand it better than you. It wasn't only for Jewish people, but for those who weren't Jewish, as Peter was one of the first to find out. It wasn't only for old people or only for young people. It wasn't only for rich people or poor people. It wasn't only for white people or only for black people. It wasn't only for him or for her. It was for you. And it wasn't only for you. It was for the people that God wants you to tell about Jesus now. There's no blockage to your knowing God. There's no boundary to his offer of friendship and family. There are no borders to the kingdom of God except for the ones that we erect, that you erect, when you stop short of saying yes to Jesus. The end of that first sentence in verse 18 is to bring you to God. That's why Jesus did all this. I think that's a lovely expression of his desire for you, for, for you to be with him. You see, he didn't just die to give you the option of coming to God. You know, I've, I've died on the cross and, and there it is. Take it or leave it. It's, it's there if you want it, this, this life with God thing. Jesus died to bring you to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I bring someone somewhere when I, I like them and, and, and I want them to be with me and I want them to experience the good thing that I've experienced. Like, hey, you, have you seen this new coffee shop? Come along with me. Let's let's get a coffee there. Have you tried this uh, takeaway? Come around and, and we'll get some together. Have you seen the view at the top of this hill? Let's go walking this weekend and, and come with me. I'll, I'll show you. It's fantastic. Jesus died to bring you to God. Have you met my father? Come with me. Come and join the family. I would so love you to be here. Come and find out how good it is to be with my father, says Jesus. Read John chapter 17. You'll hear from Jesus' own lips that expression of his desire for us to come. Come and be with him. Come and join Jesus in coming, being with Father God. Folks, consider the lengths that Jesus went to, dying on a cross. Consider then how much he loves you and desires your company. How much he loves and delights in the company of his father, God. And how much he would love you to experience life with his father, God, now and forever too. In my experience, it really is worth coming. So, so come. Jesus did all this to bring you to God. So Jesus didn't just die for sins. Peter says Jesus rose to life. Still in verse 18, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. The Spirit of God brought life to the deceased body of Jesus of Nazareth. This is not like spirit versus body stuff. That tired stereotype of when you die, your soul leaves you and you, you float off to heaven is not what Peter is saying happened to Jesus. And it's not what the Bible tells us to hope for. The Spirit of God 
brought physical life back to the Jesus who died on the cross. And it's the quality of, of this resurrected physical life. It is a different quality. It's an incorruptible, never to suffer or die again body. So suffering and, and then glory. In full, physical, technicolor, glory. Verse 21 speaks of that resurrection too. Peter's mentioned Jesus' resurrection already in this letter, in chapter 1 a couple of times, verses 3 and 21. Peter said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through him, you believe in God. You know, it's, it's because of Jesus that we believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so faith and hope are in God. Don't forget, Peter, of course, saw the physically raised Jesus for himself. He was one of the first to do so. We have stories about that in our Bibles. So Peter's not telling us that the soul floats out of the body. He's telling us that Jesus rose from the dead. That which was dead, including the body, rose to life forever. That's what Jesus experienced. And that is what our baptisms, Peter says, picture us as experiencing too. Peter links baptism to resurrection in verse 21 after taking us back to the story of Noah and being saved through the waters. The story of Noah in Genesis 6 to 9, far from being a cute tale about animals, is a devastating, disturbing story about the destruction of all sin-soaked life in this world. I think it's good that it's in our Bibles because it narrates so starkly what the end result of a sin-stained earthly life is. What would happen without God's grace on offer to us? It's destruction and separation from God forever. That, that's where the old life goes. But Noah and his family were saved and they were fully saved physically saved. Um, they were saved as a family, they were saved as a whole. Noah heard God's call and he responded to it. And he and his family were saved to begin a new life. Peter tells us that our baptisms reflect the same things happening through our faith in Jesus. So when we hear and we believe that Jesus died once and for all for our sins, and that he rose to life, never to die again. We die to the old life that ends in destruction, and we rise to this new life that's safe forever in Jesus' resurrection. Verse 21 says that baptism is the pledge of a good conscience towards God. So it's not that baptism itself makes the conscience free and makes us clean. The old idea of parents getting the wing done so that, you know, you just feel that's, that's been done where we're kind of right with God there. Or, you know, even when a, a young person or an older person comes to a believer's baptism and, and that feeling of now I've, I've had my baptism, I'm clean. That's that's not the thing. It is the once for all death and resurrection of Jesus that is celebrated in baptism. That's what makes for a good conscience before God now and forevermore.
and Jesus didn't just die for sins once and for all and rise to life, Peter says he also ascended to heaven. Verse 22 tells us that Jesus ascended to reign at the right hand of God the Father with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. So Peter's saying everything, whether on earth or in heaven, whether of this world or of the spiritual realms that the Bible describes, it is all under the authority of Jesus. Verses 19 to 20 are quite tricky. It's not totally clear what Peter means by the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago in the days of Noah. The best understanding of this that I've read is that this isn't talking about human beings, but about spiritual beings, fallen angels, the, the residents of heavenly realms who rebelled against God in the beginning that we read about at the start of Genesis chapter six, just ahead of Noah's story in those days. And the word translated preach, that, that also can be translated proclaimed. So the idea is that Jesus, in dying once and for all for sins and rising to life again, that he, he proclaimed victory over all of the spiritual forces opposed to God, that seek to break the relationship between God and his world. Jesus says, I have victory over all of that now. That seems like the best understanding of, of verses 19, 20, because it's what's there in verse 22. This image of Jesus' authority over all things, heavenly and earthly. Now, all of that might only interest a few people who are into Bible interpretation debates. But the point that Peter is making here is important for every single one of us. Jesus, through his death for our sins and his, resur his resurrection to life, he is completely victorious. And he's totally in charge. So there is nothing that can overcome his authority in your life. There's nothing that can overcome his authority in your death. Nothing that overcomes Jesus' authority over your eternity. Jesus is Lord. And for everyone in heaven and on earth who bows to that, there is for us life now and forever. For everyone who doesn't, there isn't. So have you bowed to Jesus as Lord? The Jesus who died for your sins once and for all. The Jesus who did that to bring you to God. He loves you. He wants you to be with him. The Jesus who rose to life never to die again. The Jesus who brings you the infinitely full of life through all that. Will you bow today once again? Or perhaps for the very first time.